Hey guys, Carlson here to wrap up the majority of the rest of chapter 16 with sections 5 through 8. Perfect timing, right? Because everybody's done with their Thanksgiving dinners and now we're kind of wondering where all those nutrients are going to go. Well, 90% of them are absorbed by the small intestine. And the small intestine is 6 meters long, it has 3 parts, it fills much of the peritoneal cavity and is stabilized by mesentery, which remember are sheets of tissue that provide a blood supply and uh, nervous system uh, attachment basically. And the three parts of the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. The duodenum is the first portion that connects to the stomach and it curves to provide a little nook for the pancreas. It's known as a mixing bowl because the stomach kind and the pancreatic and liver secretions meet here. They follow into the jejunum, which is this purple region here. It's about 2.5 meters long and most of the absorption and chemical digestion takes place and then leads into the ileum, which is the longest portion of the small intestine at 3.5 meters in length, which, and ends at the ileocecal valve to lead to the cecum, which is the first part of the large intestine. Now, uh, the intestinal wall has some qualities that allow all of that absorption to take place. There are circular folds, or plissae, circularas, that are composed of multitudes of villi, and those villi are covered with simple columnar epithelial that are lined with microvilli creating this brush border and because of all those villi and all that extra space made up or surface area we have a total area for absorption of two million centimeters squared now the villi also provide a network of capillaries to transport respiratory gases and carry absorbed nutrients to the liver and then if there's something that's too big to diffuse into the bloodstream these lacteals will transport these larger uh, packages and reach circulation through the lymphatic system, which we'll cover in another chapter. As far as intestinal movements, that stomach chyme that got into the duodenum enters the jejunum and is moved by weak peristaltic contractions. Once this happens, some reflexes take over, like the gastroenteric reflex, uh, due to the distension of the stomach, and the stomach basically distends or lowers due to it being filled with food. Um, the gastroileal reflex will then follow up due to a response to gastrin and relax the ileocecal valve. Peristalsis will move materials into the large intestine at this point at about a five hour mark. Now this doesn't happen without secretions and there's about 1.5 liters of intestinal juice that enter the lumen each day by osmosis or gland secretions and what they do is moisten the contents, buffer acids, and keep digestive enzymes and products in solution. It's all controlled by hormones and the nervous system and then the duodenum is going to be that focus because it needs to be protected from that acidic chyme. And here are four main hormones that you need to be aware of. Uh, gastrin is in response to incompletely digested proteins uh, Secretin is kind of watching that pH level. CCK is secreted when chyme enters with high lipid and partially digested protein content. And GIP or gastric inhibitory peptide is released when fats and carbs enter the small intestine. So overall, um, the most, most of the important digestive processes occur in the small intestine. And we have the final products of simple sugars, fatty acids, and amino acids that absorbed along with water content. But the small intestine cannot make this happen without some very uh, needed accessory organs or glands known as the liver and the pancreas. So we're going to talk about them next as well as a gallbladder. And the pancreas lies behind the stomach. It's an elongated organ. It's pinkish gray, about 15 centimeters long. And it's usually diagrammed in yellow just because it's a diagram and they uh, like to make things stand out. It has a lumpy texture. It's easily torn and it's primarily an exocrine organ, which means it secretes things. Uh, the pancreatic duct right here is what meets the duodenum with the common bile duct from the liver and the gallbladder. And most of the digestive work in the small intestine is done here with the specialized enzymes. Uh, carbohydrates break down carbohydrates, proteases break down proteins, so their name kind of lend themselves to what they break down. Now, all this can't happen without the help of the liver as well, which is a, uh, the largest visceral organ in the body. It's reddish brown and weighs about 3.3 pounds. Um, it's divided into four lobes, and underneath uh, there's, a lot, there's a recess where the gallbladder is lodged, and one-third of the blood supply is arterial and the rest is venous, and over 200 known functions are known of the liver, but we're going to focus on the top three. Uh, one of those being metabolic regulation, which, which helps with the composition of circulating blood. Now, all the blood leaving absorptive areas of the digestive tract go through the liver first. 
And what happens is these hepatocytes or liver cells will extract nutrients and toxins. They'll monitor to just circulating levels of nutrients by either removing and storing them, or if we're deficient, then they correct that by mobilizing those stored reserves. Uh, hematological regulation is another function because the, the liver is the largest blood reservoir in the body and 25% of that is cardiac output. And when blood does pass through the liver, um, these phagocytic Kupfer cells remove aged or damaged RBCs, debris or pathogens, and that's because uh, they're antigen cells and so they stimulate immune responses of this sort. Um, finally, other liver cells synthesize plasma, plasma proteins. Uh, they determine osmotic concentration of the blood, transport nutrients, and make up clotting and complement systems. And the last main role of the liver is the production and role of bile. So uh, bile is actually synthesized in the liver and excreted in the duodenum. It consists of water, ions, bilirubin, and an assortment of lipids called bile salts. Now, um, these bio salts aid in the breakdown of lipids in a process called emulsification uh, that allows enzymes to more efficiently digest them. All right, now our gallbladder. Um, kind of reminds me of the little plant off of Wally, but it's a hollow pear-shaped organ. It stores and concentrates bile prior to excretion into the small intestine. So it doesn't make the bile, it gets it from the liver uh, and it stores it there for it. Uh, bile is secreted continuously at about one liter a day. It's released in the duodenum only by stimulus. Uh, and the more fat the chyme contains, the more bile it, that is released. Uh, the other main function of the gallbladder is modification of bile. Um, it's full at about 40 to 70 milliliters of bile. And the longer that bile stays there, the more water it absorbs. And this is what could result in stones uh, due to a buildup of bile salt. So that's not something we want hanging around for too long. All right, uh, 16, seven now, we're gonna move into the large intestine that's divided into three parts, uh, the cecum, the colon, and the rectum, and you can see them here, and we'll point out each one. Um, but first of all, the large intestine lies below the stomach and the liver and frames the small intestine, so we've kind of taken it out here. Its main functions are to reabsorb water and compact the feces, absorb uh, important vitamins freed by bacterial action, and then store feces prior to defecation. Uh, the length is about 1.5 meters or 5 feet and the width is 7.5 centimeters and then 3 inches, or the same as 3 inches. Now, let's talk about each section. The cecum, uh, which is this area here, it's connected to the ileum of the small intestine and this is where compaction begins. Uh, the colon is made up of four different parts. You have the ascending colon, the transverse, which is the straight area here, the sending colon coming back down, and then your sigmoid colon, which kind of makes a little bit of an S shape. Um, it's three times larger in diameter than the small intestine, uh, but it has thinner walls. It lacks villi, but has a lot of mucus cells. It also contains pouches or hostra to allow for distension and elongation as well when the substances are moving through. And then finally, we move into the rectum. Uh, it's about the last 15 centimeters of the GI tract, and it's expandable for temporary storage, and obviously the anus there is gonna be the exit of the anal canal, and that is under voluntary control. Let's look at the absorption functions of the large intestine in more detail now. Uh, starting off with water, about 50 milliliters of water and material enters the colon each day. Uh, 200 milliliters of feces is ejected, and it's made up of 75% water, 5% bacteria, and the rest is indigestible material, small quantities of inorganic matter, and epithelial cells. Now, bile salts are also absorbed if they're not used and transported back to the liver for secretion in bile for another digestive process. And there's also organic waste, and how these occur is bacteria will convert bilirubin into other products, and these products actually end up giving us the color for our urine uh, if it's absorbed into the bloodstream, and then others will stay and be exposed to oxygen leading to a pigment change and making our feces brown. Vitamins and toxins are the other two that are absorbed by the large intestine. And remember that vitamins are organic molecules related to lipids and carbs. They're essential for metabolic reactions because they're coenzymes that allow for binding of substrates. So the bacteria in the colon generate three vitamins, uh, vitamin K, biotin, and vitamin B5. You can read how or why they're important to the body. And then toxins are absorbed, and the way we get these toxins is because bacterial actions break down peptides that remain in feces, and they'll generate ammonia, nitrogen-containing compounds, and hydrogen sulfide. And then 
after absorption they're removed safely by the liver but this is what gives our feces an, an odor that usually is not enjoyed and um, then indigestible carbs like beans they provide nutrition for this bacterial flora in our tract that we need um, and their metabolic activities and create gas or flatus so there you go some of the odors that we enjoy from the digestive system that's what they're caused by Okay, now 16.8, I'm just gonna show you a couple tables because we are actually working on this topic with our cookie digestion project. So this table is gonna be very helpful for you because it shows the enzymes uh, in the tract and their functions, what they target, and then their products. And then this one here um, is a spotlight on page 563. It shows what is digested where, starting with oral cavity through the esophagus, stomach, small intestine. The intestine of mucosa is what the small intestine is lined with. And then how those products are get, uh, getting to the bloodstream, which is obviously the most important part. So we will kind of touch more on these in detail in that project. And then we're going to stop off here at 16.9 and recap with this 16.10 and disorders and problems in the digestive system at a later time. All right, see you guys next time.